Hello children, welcome. This is Crash Course and we are discussing system of particles and rotational motion. First we will discuss the important concepts, equations and the ideas relating to this chapter. To begin with, let us take up the idea of center of mass. What is center of mass? Suppose I consider center of mass is that point at which the total mass is assumed to be concentrated. Simple. It is that point at which the total mass is assumed to be concentrated. So, it is that point at which the total mass is assumed to be concentrated. Let us consider first of all center of mass of a system of discrete particles. Let us consider the representation like this. This is x axis, here is y axis and this is z axis. Consider a couple of particles m1, m2, m3 and so on m1 has a position vector r1, m2 has a position vector r2, m3 has a position vector r3 etc. Their coordinates are x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2 and x3, y3, z3. We can consider many such particles. This is origin of course. Then the center of mass of this system is given by m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus m3 r3 whole divided by of course there are many particles we can write it this way divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3 etc. This can be written like this sigma m i r i from 1 to n whole divided by sigma m i from 1 to n. The denominator is the total mass of the system. So, I can simply write as sigma m i r i from 1 to n. This can be broken up into three parts. One along x axis, the other along y axis and the other along z axis. So, we have x c m is equal to total mass sigma m i x i from 1 to n. Then y c m is equal to 1 by m sigma m i y i from 1 to n. Likewise, z c m is equal to 1 by m sigma m i z i from 1 to n. So, for a system of discrete particles, this is how you find the center of mass. But what if it is a continuous mass. What if it is a continuous mass distribution? For example, we have this arrangement, you can consider this as x axis, y axis and z axis and you have a continuous mass distribution like say a, a rigid object of this form. Then assume that its mass is m this is origin then what you do is you are going to consider a small mass dm whose position vector is r and you are going to find the center of mass by considering it like this 1 by m integral r dm and you can integrate it to get your x cm y cm and z cm 1 by m integral x dm y c m is equal to 1 by m integral y d m and z c m is equal to 1 by m where m is the total mass integral z d m. Right? So, it is a very simple idea. Here x remember x y z are the coordinates of the mass which we have selected with reference to the origin. Simple thing. 
Suppose I consider say an object from which a part is removed. Center of mass of an object after the removal of a part. Here it becomes something like this. Ori suppose the original mass is m mass removed. Removed mass is small mc. Then the new formula or the formula changes to xcm is equal to mx minus mx dash divided by m minus m ycm is equal to my minus my dash divided by m minus m and zcm is equal to mz minus m z dash divided by m minus m these are already known to us what are the other three x y and z refer to center of mass of the original part that means the object from which nothing is removed x dash y dash and z dash are cm of the removed part, the part which is removed. So you can find out the XCM and YCM and ZCM using this idea of if part is removed from the object. Let's just recall a uh, center of mass of some important center of mass of some important shapes. For example, half ring something like this let's assume that this is x axis and this is y axis this is the origin then the center of mass is here at a height say y and this y is given by 2 r divided by pi r being the radius r being the radius segment of a ring something like this a symmetric segment this is again x axis this is y axis etc and this angle is theta and this is at a height y say then uh, radius is of course r then the center of mass is located at a height r sin theta divided by theta r sin theta divided by theta. A half disk, for example, let us consider a half disk like this. Remember, this is a disk or plate. This is of radius r, this is x axis, this is y axis, etc. And it is at a height y. y is given by 4 by 3 r divided by pi. This is for a half disk. Suppose I consider sector of a disk, a symmetric one of course, asymmetric, a symmetric one, not asymmetric, x and y. This is theta and the center of mass is at a height y c then this is given by 2 r sin theta divided by 3 theta. I urge you to remember them. A hollow hemisphere. Assuming it to be at a height of y then y is given by 3 r divided by 8 r is the radius. Sorry, this is a hollow hemisphere. This is r by 2. I am sorry. This is r by 2. Hollow hemisphere. While for a solid hemisphere, y is given by 3 r by 8. 
this is solid for a solid one it is 3r divided by 8 while for a hollow hemisphere it is r divided by 2 remember these are measured from the center a hollow cone of height h and this is x axis etc from this point assume that center of mass is at a height y so y is equal to h divided by 3 while for a solid cone this is a solid cone of height h and again this is x axis this is y axis etc and this is at a height y then y is given by h divided by 4. So, I uh, urge you to remember these values uh, worth remembering because uh, you may not be able to derive this all the time. It is uh, these equations are worth remembering instead of trying to derive them all the time. Remember, do not try to derive them all the time. Okay. Suppose I consider motion of center of mass what happens, how to find out, how to analyze etc. Now, for a system of particles, velocity of center of mass is nothing um, but the derivative of position of center of mass. So, this simply becomes m1 v1 plus m2 v2 plus m3 v3 etc whole divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3 and so on. What if I consider acceleration? Acceleration of center of mass is m1 a1 plus m2 a2 plus m3 a3 etc. whole divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3. Now, actually uh, if you look at this equation, you notice that d by dt of m into vcm you know is nothing but force that is actually external force. So, if external force is 0 then we notice that m into vcm is equal to constant that is nothing but the law of conservation of momentum. For a system of particles, the law of conservation of momentum tells us that the velocity of the center of mass is unaffected by internal forces or if the external force is 0, the center of mass remains fixed. So, these are some basic ideas regarding the center of mass. Now, let us take up the idea of the rotational motion of rigid bodies. Now, let us just recall some basic equations, basic idea. Angular velocity, you know, is given by d theta divided by dt, a vector quantity. Angular acceleration is given by alpha which is d omega by dt this can also be written as d square theta by dt square angular momentum is nothing but r cross p that is i omega and the rotational analog of force which is torque is given by tau is equal to r cross f and this can also be written as the rate of change of angular momentum dl divided by dt and the rotational kinetic energy you know is given by k is equal to half i omega square in terms of angular momentum this is given by l square divided by 2i the equations suppose i consider constant angular acceleration then the equations of rotational motion 
can be written like this omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t theta is equal to omega naught t plus half alpha t square omega square is equal to omega naught square plus 2 alpha theta and theta n is equal to omega naught plus alpha divided by 2 into 2n minus 1 this is the distance traveled or angular displacement in the nth second of the journey a couple of important informations in the present context are like this so what are those things let's try to understand suppose i consider the idea of torque you know torque is nothing but quantity which produces angular motion just like force produces angular acceleration torque produces angular just like force produces linear acceleration torque produces angular acceleration now if you compare the linear motion and angular motion linear motion is controlled by its inertia measured in terms of mass not exactly uh, in terms of mass but a quantity related to mass likewise the rotational inertia is understood in terms of a quantity known as moment of inertia it is represented in terms of moment of inertia moment of inertia uh, is basically a tensor but for a fixed axis it is scalar quantity now let us consider a point mass for example let us consider this structure here is the axis of rotation let's assume that this is the axis of rotation and a particle is capable of going round in this circle at a distance r mass is m then the moment of inertia is given by m into r square moment of inertia is given by m r square suppose i consider a couple of particles for example a particle of mass m1 at a distance r1 m2 at a distance of r2 m3 at a distance of r3 etc present then the moment of inertia of this system is given by m1 r1 square plus m2 r2 square plus m3 r3 square etc so this is the moment of inertia of a system of discrete particles moment of inertia of a system of discrete particles now the question is what if the object is a con uh, continuous mass system for example here is a continuous mass distribution and it is rotating about this axis then how to do that i will take a small mass dm let's assume that it is at a distance r then the moment of inertia of this small mass is given by dm into r square so the total moment of inertia is given by integral dm into r square so moment of inertia of a continuous mass distribution is given by this particular idea i is equal to integral dm r square this idea actually takes us to the idea of radius of gyration also so what is radius of gyration radius of gyration is the distance at which the mass is assumed to be concentrated such that we get the same moment of inertia so we get the same moment of inertia so we choose that point in such a way that the moment of inertia obtained is same as before that means we can write i is equal to mk square for example if i want to replace say this extended object by a point mass and if k is this distance then k becomes the radius of gyration so the requirement is that this particle and the uh, replaced mass or the extended object should have the same moment of inertia 
so basically radius of gyration is nothing but i divided by m where i is the moment of inertia of the given object and m is the mass of the given object There are two important theorems as far as moment of inertia is concerned. One is what is known as theorem of parallel axis and the second is theorem of perpendicular axis. Let us see what is that. According to parallel axis theorem, suppose I know this uh, moment of inertia of an object about its center of mass. I will call it as ICM. I can find out the moment of inertia about any other axis. How? About any other axis, the moment of inertia is moment of inertia through center of mass plus mass of the object into separation between these two parallel axis square. So, I is equal to ICM plus MD square, where ICM is the moment of inertia through a parallel axis passing through the center of mass and d is the separation between these two parallel axes. So, according to parallel axis theorem, the moment of inertia of an object about any axis is equal to sum of moment of inertia about a parallel axis passing through the center of mass and the product of mass and separation square which separation? Separation between their axes. Second is theorem of perpendicular axis. Theorem of perpendicular axis. This is applicable only for planar objects. For example, let me consider a planar object, maybe in the form of a plate. Moment of inertia about this axis, the axis which is perpendicular, is equal to sum of the moment of inertia about other two perpendicular axes and passing through the same point means if I call this as say x axis, this as y axis, this becomes z axis, then i z is equal to i x plus i y, i z is equal to i x plus i y. Remember two things, this is a valid only for planar objects, moment of inertia of a planar object about an axis perpendicular to the plane is equal to sum of moment of inertia about any two perpendicular axis in the plane of the object and concurrent with the first axis lying in the plane and concurrent with the first axis. This is perpendicular axis theorem. Let us take a moment of inertia of some standard objects worth remembering moment of inertia about some stand of some standard objects. Remember these are all important. For example, a point object. Mass is m, distance is r. So, no moment of inertia is m r square. Moment of inertia of a rod. For example, this is the axis assume, this is the length, then moment of inertia is ml square by 3, about one end axis, rod and perpendicular bisector, then moment of, this is of course L, this entire length is L, so uh, mass is m, moment of inertia is ml square divided by 12 ml square by 12. Solid sphere about this diameter, the moment of inertia is 2 by 5 mr square, r is the radius. 
ring about this axis the moment of inertia is mr square disk about this axis the moment of inertia is mr square divided by 2 a rectangular plate this is l and this is b and this is the axis about which it is rotating then about this axis the moment of inertia is m l square divided by 12 if i consider this axis the moment of inertia is m b square divided by 12 so about an axis in its plane it is m l square by 12 or m b square divided by 12 same plate this is the axis assume that this length is l this length is b then about this axis the moment of inertia is m into l square plus b square divided by 12 l square plus b square divided by 12 a circular hollow disk like this this is of radius r1 and this is of radius r2 and the moment of inertia about this axis is m by 2 r1 square plus r2 square m by 2 r1 square plus r2 square that's the moment of inertia hollow cylinder of radius sir and assume that this is the axis of rotation then moment of inertia is m r square same thing this time the axis is different this again is a hollow cylinder now assume that this is the axis of rotation this is of length l radius is r etc then about this axis the moment of inertia is m into l square by 12 plus r square divided by 2 of course this is a hollow cylinder remember solid cylinder about this axis the moment of inertia is m r square divided by 2 suppose i consider the same thing now the axis is different assume that this is the axis of rotation l is its length r is the radius etc then moment of inertia is given by m into l square by 12 plus r square divided by 4 a hollow sphere in the case of a hollow sphere of radius r about any diametrical axis the moment of inertia is 2 by 3 m r square 2 by 3 m r square so these are some important ideas which should be kept in mind remember these important things they are useful while solving problems one of the most important ideas as far as the competitive examination is concerned is that of rolling motion what is rolling motion
motion is said to be rolling if the point of contact no is not sliding we can say this actually pure rolling uh, this can be understood like this in the case of sliding motion the surface in contact keeps or say the same surface of contact is seen all along in the case of rolling motion it's basically the point of contact object is said to be rolling if it is moving on a given surface for example i'll take a simple example maybe that of a cylinder now if it is uh, say uh, spin and release then it starts moving like this this is an example of rolling motion that of say bicycle wheel or say a wheel let's assume that this is rolling and r is its radius m is the mass and it is moving or say rolling at a constant angular velocity omega if it is rolling at a constant angular velocity omega so clearly it uh, has two velocities one is translational velocity the center of mass is moving it is in translational motion and it is rotating as well so the total kinetic energy comprises of translational kinetic energy plus rotational kinetic energy translational kinetic energy is half mv square rotational kinetic energy is half i omega square remember this i is measured about the center of mass v is the velocity of center of mass so you can simplify it further actually half m v cm square into 1 plus i can write it as i cm into omega square divided by m v cm square half m v cm square 1 plus you know i cm can be written as what is it m k square correct and v cm can be written as r square omega square so i cm divided by if we look at this term this becomes i cm is m k square omega square m into r square omega square m's cancel omega squares cancel and we are left with 1 plus k square divided by r square so the total kinetic energy of a body which is in rolling is given by half m v c m square plus i mean into 1 plus k square divided by r square where k is the radius of gyration and it also has total angular momentum given by its translational motion which is m into vcm into r momentum into distance linear momentum into separation plus because it is rolling or rotating it also has angular momentum given by icm into omega one of the important discussions here is that of pure rolling rolling is said to be pure if it does not slip that means there is no slipping of the point of contact suppose i consider a stationary surface then the condition for pure rolling is given by vcm is equal to r omega and if it is accelerated in the case of an accelerated motion acm is equal to r alpha now what if vcm is more than r omega in that case it is rolling with forward slipping if vcm is less than r omega 
then it is rolling with backward slipping. Rolling with backward slipping. And as we have already seen, the total kinetic energy is half mvcm square into 1 plus k square divided by r square. Remember this expression, a quite useful expression. One of the very important applications is pure rolling on an inclined plane. Pure rolling on an inclined plane. For example, you can consider say an inclined plane of inclination theta on which a sphere of mass m radius r is released. It can be a sphere or cylinder or ring anything of course, anything that can undergo pure rolling. So, some important equations which are worth remembering are here. Number one, acceleration a is equal to g sin theta divided by 1 plus k square divided by r square. Remember, in order that it undergoes pure rolling, friction has to be present. If friction is absent, there can't be no rolling, no pure rolling on an inclined plane. So, minimum coefficient of friction is given by tan theta divided by 1 plus r square divided by k square. Remember these results as far as pure rolling on inclined plane as is concerned the acceleration is g sin theta by 1 plus k square by r square and the minimum coefficient of friction is given by this value mu minimum is equal to tan theta by 1 plus r square by k square. One of the very important applications of all these concepts is in the form of torque and the relation to angular momentum. Now, torque is given by I alpha and this can be simplified further I into d omega by dt and this becomes d by dt of I omega. I am just rearranging this. But you know, this i omega is nothing but the angular momentum. So, dl divided by dt. So, dl divided by dt. Or we have torque is equal to rate of change of angular momentum. So, if torque is 0, clearly dl divided by dt is also 0. Or this gives us L is equal to constant, which is nothing but conservation of angular momentum, conservation of angular momentum. Simple terms, if the external torque is 0, the angular momentum of the system remains conserved. Angular momentum remains conserved. Suppose I consider this torque, the torque does certain amount of work also. How to find out that? If we are supposed to calculate the work, the first thing is to check whether the torque is constant or torque is varying. If the torque is constant, we can simply write work done is equal to tau into delta theta, where delta theta is the angular displacement. Otherwise, it is written as integral tau d theta, integral tau d theta. So, work done by this is uh, given by this particular work done by the work, work done by the torque that is constant torque or variable torque is given by this expression. So, these are some important concepts as far as rotational motion is concerned. We will continue with numerical problems in our next session. This is crash course. And the chapter for our current discussion is gravitation. This small chapter is in fact an easy chapter and 
uh, in competitive examinations you can solve the problems pretty easily if you are familiar with some basic ideas let's take up those discussions and familiarize ourselves with the equations to be used first of all the idea of newton's law of gravitation consider two point masses m1 and m2 separated by distance r then according to newton's law of gravitation the force of attraction between them is given by g m1 m2 divided by r square where g is nothing but gravitational constant and this force is always directed towards each other this is a attractive force remember as it is a conservative force field mechanical energy is conserved and remember this is also a central force field the angular momentum is also conserved in order to understand the force the idea of force we need to understand it in terms of gravitational field what is gravitational field it is a region of influence in which another mass experiences a force couple of important relations here field due to a point mass for example here is a point mass m and our intention is to get the gravitational field at this point p then the gravitational field at this point p is given by gm divided by r square gm divided by r square what if i consider a spherical shell let us consider a spherical shell of radius r and we are interested in finding the field at various points for example first point outside at a distance r then the gravitational field at a point outside is given by gm divided by r square as if a point mass is located at its center at a point on the surface at a point on the surface it is given by gm divided by r square and at a point inside the gravitational field is zero gravitational field is zero remember the direction is always towards the center of the sphere so if we try to plot a graph of this gravitational field versus distance is something like this remember it is always directed towards the center so i'm going to show it here is something like this this corresponds to radius right it corresponds to this one so up to the center it remains zero and outside it goes on decreasing as per 1 by r square relation what if it is due to a solid sphere gravitational field due to a solid sphere here is a solid sphere of radius r mass m and the gravitational field at a point outside at a distance r is again given by gm divided by r square as though a point mass is located at the center at a point on the surface it is gm divided by capital r square while that at a point inside is given by gm r divided by r cube r is this distance from the center so gm r divided by r cube so notice that inside the gravitational field is directly proportional to its uh, separation from the center so if i draw gravitational field versus distance graph is something like this 
as you go from center towards the surface the gravitational field increases in magnitude and it's directly proportional to r it reaches its maximum value and it again goes on decreasing according to 1 by r square law so it is 1 by r square law here proportional to 1 by r square and this corresponds to the surface or the radius is r variation of acceleration due to gravity you know acceleration due to gravity is basically given by gm divided by r square suppose i consider at a height h the acceleration due to gravity is given by g dash is equal to gm divided by r plus h whole square and if h is very small compared to r then we have g dash is equal to g into 1 minus 2h divided by r remember conditions apply h should be pretty small compared to r at a depth acceleration due to gravity at a depth is given by gm into r minus d divided by r cube or this is given by g into 1 minus d divided by r and remember it is affected by uh, rotation of the earth also it is affected by uh, rotation of earth so due to the rotation acceleration due to gravity is given by g minus omega square r into cos square lambda where lambda is the angle of latitude so angle of latitude so g dash is equal to omega square g minus omega square r cos square lambda and of course omega is the angular velocity of the earth gravitational potential gravitational potential due to a point mass at a distance r for example here is a mass m and at a distance r we want to find out then this is given by minus gm divided by r remember gravitational potential is negative because the gravitational force is always an attractive force gravitational potential is negative due to a spherical shell We got a spherical shell of radius r then outside at a distance r it is given by minus gm divided by r and inside at a distance r or on the surface so i'll write on the surface and inside both are given by the same equation minus gm divided by r so remember the gravitational potential is constant inside a spherical shell so if i plot a graph of v versus r is something like this it remains constant at a at a value minus gm by r up to the surface it is constant outside it is 1 by r dependent curve 1 by r dependent curve what if I consider a solid sphere? What a solid sphere of radius r whose mass is m, then at a distance r outside, gravitational potential is minus gm divided by r, and that on the surface is minus gm divided by r. Well, that inside is given by 
minus gm into 3 r square minus r square divided by 2 r cube 2 r cube assuming of course the density to remain constant so if i plot a graph of v versus r the nature of the graph is like this at the center if i put r is equal to 0 it gives me 3 by 2 times the potential at the surface and it changes like this up to the surface this is minus 3 by 2 gm divided by r and it is minus gm divided by r at the surface and then it goes on decreasing according to 1 by r relation so it is proportional to 1 by r so the variation of the gravitational potential is given by this expression due to a thin ring for example you got a thin ring of mass m whose radius is r then at a point distant x from the center it is given by minus gm divided by square root of r square plus x square what about at the center at the center i can put x is equal to 0 and i am left with minus gm divided by r which means that this is as good as the potential due to a point mass located anywhere on the circumference of this one that's right so it is as good as the idea of potential due to a point mass so there are some basic ideas regarding the gravitational potential let us consider the idea of satellites and the idea of energy Let us consider a planet of mass m and radius r. Then escape velocity from the planet is given by square root of 2 g m divided by r. Suppose I consider the orbital velocity. That means there is a low orbital satellite then the orbital velocity is given by square root of gm divided by r or this can be written as square root of gm divided by r plus h this is our expression for the uh, orbital velocity if h is very small compared to r then this expression reduces to orbital velocity is equal to square root of gm divided by r or this is as good as escape velocity divided by root 2 escape velocity divided by root 2 from the surface let us consider the same thing m and r are the mass and radius of the planet and here is a satellite the time period of this satellite is given by 2 pi r divided by v as expected this is r 2 pi r divided by v and that can be simplified further we can find that value of substitute for that value of v over here and it becomes 2 pi into r root r divided by root gm 2 pi r to the power of 3 by 2 divided by root gm if i consider the same satellite its energies are like this first of all potential energy potential energy is given by minus gm m divided by r 
एंड काइनेटिक एनर्जी इज गिवन बाय हाफ एम वी स्क्वेर एंड इफ आई सब्सटीट्यूट फॉर दैट वी आई गेट जी एम एम डिवाइडेड बाई टू आर एंड देर फॉर वट इज द टोटल मैकेनिकल एनर्जी द टोटल मैकेनिकल एनर्जी इज यू प्लस के विच इज माइनस जी एम एम डिवाइडेड बाई टू आर सो दीज आर द इम्पॉर्टेंट एनर्जीज ऑफ ए सैटेलाइट ऑल्सो रिमेंबर समटाइम्स द क्वेश्चन आर आस्ड एस वॉट इज दैट बाइंडिंग एनर्जी very simple binding energy is the negative of its total energy which simply is gmm divided by 2r kepler's laws deal with the motion of the planets around the sun There are three laws. The first law is known as law of orbits. According to which, the path is elliptical, and the sun is at one of the foci, or say it is at one focus. It is first law. So, according to first law, the planets. revolve in elliptical path with sun at a focus second law is law of areas according to which the aerial velocity is constant what is that aerial velocity it is the rate at which area is swept that is nothing but da by dt is constant and this is equal to l divided by 2m where l is the angular momentum where l is the angular momentum third law is a law of periods according to which the square of the period is directly proportional to cube of the mean radius directly proportional to cube of the mean what is that a a is actually r max semi major axis and semi minor axis come here r max plus r minimum divided by 2 many times for circular orbits it becomes very simple for circular orbits it is t square directly proportional to r cube but remember this is actually the mean radius the mean radius a is nothing but the mean radius so mean radius cube so remember these three laws these are quite important